Well, hey, welcome back to, believe it or not, season four of Armchair Architects. You folks said you wanted more, and we're here to deliver. Specifically, you wanted us to talk about AI. So that's what we're going to talk about. And I want to jump sort of right into that conversation. Well, hey, Eric. Hey, Uli. Welcome to season four. Um, Eric, you and I were talking about an experience you had in the land of ChatGPT and BARD, right? Um, can you talk about why we're actually talking about this topic at all? We're going to talk a little bit about um, large language models, or you're here I say LLM a lot, just as a short way of saying that. You were saying there was a start, there was a reason why we're talking about this because you had this experience. What was that experience? Well, I think that everybody has had this disruptive experience where you realize that these hosted foundational models or large language models like ChatGPT kind of changed our lives in unexpected and delightful ways. Um, the the most uh, impactful way I've seen it impact, you know, what I do and how I do it is supporting my role as an architect. Uh, and so as architects, we need to understand the what, right? The product features, the prioritized requirements, the non-functional requirements. Uh, and then we usually go off and we start doing our own research, right? Like there's all these patterns, which we've talked about on this show, the bulkhead pattern, the orchestrator pattern, and how do I apply it to these requirements? Uh, and then this thing called generative AI came along and you know, one of us got the idea uh, to just say, hey, well, why don't I take some of the requirements and then plug them into this chat GPT and then tell it that I think that the orchestration model has a role to play here. What do you think? And then, the result was through some prompt engineering, a really cogent response around how to meet the requirements, understand all the features, both functional, and non-functional, and adhere to the architectural patterns and get some recommendations as to what some other patterns might be um, that might be relevant. And so quickly what became kind of like a manual, let me go find it, let me, let me rack my brain because the experience is up there, let me jot it down, let me figure out what platforms do this, uh, now I have a research assistant that has architectural chops. Now, ultimately, I have to be the arbiter of whether or not it's correct, because we don't want to do deal with hallucinations. But it's a great starting point for what used to be a manual activity. And so that's kind of what I went through as part of like thinking about how architects can leverage this foundational model capability in their day to day. Well, yeah, you threw a bunch have... of. You yeah, threw a bunch ahead, of interesting terms out, my friend. Maybe, Eric, we should talk a little bit about what prompt engineering really means, um, what hallucinations are, and stuff like that, I think. Well, let's just start um, out what, what, what a large language model is, just for the people. Right. Like, like maybe some people don't know what that term means. Um, either one you take, like, like, just define that quickly so we, can move, so we can include that in the conversation easily. So at the end of the day, a large language model is a continuation of two technologies. They just are getting bigger and bigger. So the first one is neural networks, uh, which was a technology invented in the 90s. And that effectively was outcome out of the whole AI work that led to this notion of neural networks. And then in 2015, deep learning uh, was invented uh, by our friends from Google. And it's effectively, either way, I look at it, if, uh, if you're a Dune fan, I always look at it as space folding. Well, uh, these guys effectively, are folding the neural network to allow bigger depth. That's why it's called deep learning. And <clears throat> the open AI folks together with the Azure AI infrastructure were able to push this into a size um, of trillions of variables that effectively make it such a big, large language model. And it's focused on human language, which is really important to uh, understand because it's not just speech like what we're doing right now, or words, it's also images, uh, code, um, and so forth, that are all human expression of how we communicate. And large language models are really communication models at the end of the day. Um, and that's really what we have seen with OpenAI, with BARD, uh, with the Llama models from Meta, and so forth. OK, and so prompt engineering is presumably, what do we mean by prompt engineering? Let's just get that one done, too. The way I think about prompt engineering is it's utilizing human expertise within a specific domain to steer the model to produce productive outputs. So the way I explain it to my family is uh, a large language model is doing nothing but utilizing its vast training corpus of information to predict the next most likely cogent word in a sequence of words. That's what it's doing. And 
prompt engineering is a way of structuring a query so that the most accurate output is achieved based on the results of what you input as the question. So instead of asking it, you know, what are some or what are some great patterns I could use to create a microservice? You might say you might get the whole dump of information, but it might not be refined enough. And so your next iteration is, well, how do I actually construct a prompt so that it specifically outputs the information in a way that I can actually take it and now do something with it? Of course, there's that check, right? The hallucination check, which we should right. probably also spend some time talking about. Yeah, but before we go to hallucinations, the way I think about prompt engineering is a direction, um, the way you described it, Eric, but the other half is constraining. Because the corpus is so wide that the system has access to, think of this as human knowledge uh, acquired over thousands of years, encoded in this um, model. Now you need to effectively tell it uh, to go and constrain what it's looking at. Like one of the niftiest tricks I've seen in prompt engineering is that you can actually ask the model to take on a persona. So for example, please assume that you're a software architect and I'm looking for patterns for microservices uh, implementations. That allows the model to switch, logically speaking, its perspective and go and uh, say, ah, I'm a software engineer. I know what that means. And therefore, I'm putting myself into a specific set of constraints to uh, get better and deeper outputs than if I go broad without any constraints. So what's a good example for an architect to stay, to keep us on, this, on the same track of, of a, a prompt that would make sense that an architect would want to ask that is suitably constrained to get a to get an answer that's actually useful versus like, you know, like, oh, yeah, like you should do stuff really well. <laughs> I, I think I have a great idea that folds in everything we've been talking about here. Oh, time out from the host. We're about to head into a slightly different direction. So let's take this as part two of this episode. Join us for that part.